last class we started off with philippians right so we've, we're done with galatians and ephesians and we've uh, started off with philippians and we looked at the background uh, of philippians we looked at uh, about the city and uh, we also uh, learned a little bit about um, uh, about uh, um, yeah, just one minute now sorry yeah, yeah. Um, so we learned about um, how um, the the work of uh, uh, Paul started in Philippi and um, during his second missionary journey, and uh, we also looked at um, uh, the the believer, the early, the first few believers in uh, who are mentioned in the book of Acts as Paul went there and ministered there uh, in Philippi. Right, we uh, we read about um, Lydia in Acts chapter sixteen. Um, Lydia, who becomes a believer, who's a businesswoman, who's selling textile, if I mean fabric, and uh, and um, she comes to know the Lord, and she and her household they are baptized. And uh, from verse sixteen onwards, we read about the um, slave girl who was uh, possessed with a spirit of divination, and she's set free. She's delivered, and uh, and then Paul and Silas are thrown into prison, right? And then we see that um, uh, after that, um, uh, 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 then the jailer and his household they come to know the Lord, right? He sees this, uh, their their whole uh, uh, response. I uh, mean, the, 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 when he sees them. And hears them praising God and worshiping God, and and uh, and what happens uh, at midnight and um, uh, after the earthquake, and you know he comes to know the Lord, and he and his household are baptized, and um, you know all that happens in all this happens in Philippi. So right, so um, so we moved on to Philippi chapter one, and then we. Uh, we see that Paul is actually remembering the Philippian um, uh, uh, believers very fondly in his uh, in his epistle, um, and um, we we see that uh, it was uh, you know uh, it was after his uh, prob I mean it, it was after his missionary journey, and uh, maybe it was um, you know it was written um, maybe. AD 60 or AD 61, 62, around that time um, uh, in Paul's life. And and it was written uh, from prison, right? He mentions that in the uh, in the epistle itself, that his chains are in Christ. And he is, you know, he's, he's in fact, um, encouraging the Philippine uh, uh, believers uh, to be uh, to be strong in the Lord and so on. And, uh, and he's saying that, uh, you know the the whole guard, the prisoner. I mean, the guards who are there guarding him. In fact, uh, they also know why he is why he is in prison, the reason for his imprisonment, and so on. Right. So, um, so we see all that. Uh, Paul mentions all that in chapter one. Okay. So, um, just to review a few things in chapter one, like Paul um, talks about the believers and he uh, in Philippi, and he says that uh, you know he always remembers them fondly. Right, he says, "I thank my God." That's what we see in um, verse three. And right? he says, "I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, and always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy." Right, and uh, uh, in in for their fellowship in the gospel. So the the Philippine believers, the uh, Philipp Philippi, we see is in the region of Macedonia, and uh, um, we see that uh, Paul talking about these believers in um, in second corinthians right so he mentions that they were not um uh, very uh, uh, i mean they were not very rich they were quite poor most of them and yet out of their poverty they they chose to support the work of the gospel like even at a time when paul was not um, you know, reaching out to the Corinthian church for his support, he never asked any of them. Uh, but the, um, the 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 Philippian 
believers, the believers from Philippi, they were supporting, and on all the other churches in Macedonia, they were also, you know, they were supporting uh, Paul's ministry. And so he talks about the fellowship of the gospel that they shared uh, along with Paul, right? So, um, and he also says, uh, you know, um, because I, uh, you know, in verse seven, and it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart in as much as both in my chains and in the defense and conf confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. So he's reiterating that uh, uh, they are uh, partakers of the ministry, partakers of the ministry of the gospel. Right. Um, okay. Let's um, let's just move on to um, verse twelve. Oh, maybe from verse 8, let me just read from verse 8. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. So this is something that he he prays uh, over the, uh, the believers, the church in Philippi. And uh, he says that, that uh, his prayer is that their love will abound more and more, will increase more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Right? So it's uh, uh, that the, the, the love will increase um, in knowledge and in discernment that the love for God, love for people will increase with uh, the knowledge of God and in all discernment and in the expression of all discernment or, or in the use of discernment in their lives. He, he prays that that will also increase in their lives, right? So he says, with the knowledge and the discernment that you may approve those things that are excellent and uh, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So this is something that he prays. He says that, that you may approve those things that are excellent, you know, with the knowledge and with the discernment and, and your love abounding more and more, that you may approve those things that are excellent, right? So you use your discernment and you, and, uh, you approve those things and uh, um, meaning accept and also uh, uh, receive and accept and and make a choice, right? make a choice saying, okay, these things are good and these things are excellent. And so it's, uh, you know, it, it could be something to do with the Lord or it could be anything to do with uh, their life and uh, the life choices, right? In knowledge and discernment, helping them to make um, those things, uh, you know, make those choices and approve uh, those things that are excellent. So. Um, um, and then he goes on to say, being filled with all, with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Okay. And before that, in verse 10, he says, um, second part of verse 10, that you may be sincere and without offense, sincere and without offense uh, till the day of Jesus Christ. So till the Lord comes back. Right? that you may be sincere and without offense, uh, meaning that, uh, you know, that you may be faultless, that you may, uh, and the word offense that is uh, used there is like that you may, uh, uh, you know, not do something leading to sin, right? or if you, you know, that you may be faultless. Right? Um, and, Till the day of Christ. So it's not uh, a short term thing, but saying, okay, let this be your life. Right? Being sincere and being without offense, let this let it be part of your life. Let it not be just uh, you know a short term thing, right? Or uh, only on certain days. No, it's let it be part of your life, let it be your lifestyle. Right? That's what uh, Paul means by that. Um, so he prays that over them. Okay? And with the fruits of righteousness, that the outworking of the, of the very nature of God, 
which is righteousness or right standing, a right doing, right? So that you may be filled with it, right? And uh, that's, his, that's his prayer and wish that, uh, that they will, you know, uh, and, the, uh, and the word that is used there, uh, filled, it um, in the Greek it means uh, literally means to you know to stuff something uh, in. Right? Sometimes you you know you let's say you you take a box or you take a uh, you know a plastic bag or something and then you you just keep stuffing things in it. Right? That's the picture. Right? Uh, just cramming things in. Uh, and he's saying you know that's what I you know I want to see that the the fruits of righteousness or the works of righteousness in your life. Um, that you be filled with it, you know, that literally uh, let it be crammed up, let it be just stuffed, you know. So it, that is that is what comes out, right? So the, the fruits of righteousness. So, so in other words, he's just saying, you know, let it just overflow, right? This good works or uh, the, the very Christ-likeness and the character of God and everything, let it just overflow. Right? Let it be, uh, let your life overflow with it. Um, so saying that you will be filled with the fruits of righteousness and uh, this work of righteousness or the fruits of righteousness is um, is not something that you know th that comes from you this is not something that is manufactured by you or produced by you which are these are by the lord jesus right and it is to the praise of god so god is praised uh, he is glorified when your life um, is filled with these fruits or the outworking uh, of righteousness, right? Okay, so let's um, let's read from uh, twelve to seventeen, right? Uh, verse twelve onwards. Okay, um, just a minute. Let me just share this screen. Okay. Okay. So, verse twelve to say maybe eighteen. Uh, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed speak Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. But the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this, I rejoice. Yes, and will rejoice. Okay. So uh, an amazing perspective that we see here. So Paul says, you know, I want you to know that the things which have happened actually happened for the good. Well, I might be imprisoned. Well, I might be. I might have lost my freedom. Uh, but if you look at the big picture, excuse me. Saying if you look at it, it has actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Okay, and um, and it says that, um, and it's become clear. It has become evident to the palace guards that my chains are in Christ. So, um, you know, they they realize that he is being imprisoned for the sake of the gospel. So maybe he had a conversation or they might, they might have been curious, okay, why is this person in prison? What crime did he commit? And then that was also an opportunity for him to talk about, uh, talk about Christ. So he's saying, you know, all the things that have happened have, have actually happened for the furtherance of the gospel have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so uh you know and uh, and also what has happened is that uh, so that is one side 
of the thing that people have come to know, even the guards and everyone has come have come to know um, why he's been imprisoned and the reason for his imprisonment. But at, on the other side, uh, even those who are free, even those who are the, the, the other believers, they have become bolder. So he says that, um, you know, most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Somehow the, Paul being in prison and, and going through this, um, you know, difficulty and being persecuted, uh, somehow that seems to have, you know, Paul being the role model that he is, um, that seems to have emboldened. Uh, the church emboldened the, the other believers. So they are also very confident and speaking and the word of God and they share the gospel without, they are beginning to share the gospel without fear. Uh, at the same time, you know, not all is good because there are some believers, you know, he mentions just like how we studied in the Corinthians that some preach the gospel from envy and strife, right? They are envious of others, and uh, maybe they uh, is talking about strife, or they are quarrelling and uh, not getting along, and uh, intense quarrel. So there is strife, and some some are preaching for the wrong reasons, right? Even out of envy, maybe they are comparing their their lives with others lives and their ministry with others ministry and uh, you know the the fruit of their work the effectiveness of their work with others works and and he's saying they preach out of envy and strife which is sad um and uh, from selfish ambition okay so they the motive for their ministry and preaching is that they will get something out of it that their name uh becomes famous right it's a selfish ambition um and and not really serving the purpose of of the kingdom of god um and also supposing to add affliction to my chains okay so so saying you know supposing to add to my suffering you know when when i hear about all these uh all these uh things uh, and maybe the, they, they are comparing themselves with Paul and they are comparing themselves with the other believers and preaching out of envy and uh, so uh, you know they, for Paul it was it was when they maybe you know even maligned his name or discredited him and uh, uh, like we saw in the uh, you know earlier epistles that they were speaking ill of Paul <laughs> And so on. So, uh, trying to discredit his ministry, and maybe they were doing that also. So, saying, supposing to add affliction, add to my suffering, right? Um, but then this is what he says, um, verse seventeen, right? There are, but there are some who are preaching out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So they are preaching with the right reason for the right reasons <laughs> excuse me and um, and and then uh, and paul says that okay what then only that in every way whether in pretense or in truth christ is preached right excuse me Whether in pretense or in truth, whatever be the intention, whatever be the motivation, he's saying, I'm happy that Christ is being preached, right? Uh, the gospel is being shared. So, so the thing is, the truth is, uh, is being spread, right? Even out of even out of wrong motivation, something good is coming out of it, um, and so saying, and in this I rejoice. Okay, in this I rejoice, and and will rejoice. So, um, so he's saying I I rejoice in this. Right? Verse verse eighteen. 
whether it's in pretense or whether it's in truth, uh, since I know that the gospel is being preached, I I rejoice in this, right? So, and the word there again, rejoice, which means to to be to be happy, to be uh, uh, to be cheerful, right? To and uh, so it's, it's it's saying that. I'm happy and I'm being cheerful uh, because of uh, Christ's message or the gospel being preached. Okay, I'm rejoicing in this. Right. Okay. Verse 19. For I know. Um, let me just move the. Sorry. Yeah. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, and but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be, and be with Christ, which is far better, Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confidence, confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. That your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Okay. So, so Paul, verse 19 says that, I know this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer. Okay. So the church has been praying for Paul. And uh, it says that, you know, through your prayer and by the work, the ministry of the Spirit of God, uh, says the ministry, or he says, by the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, by the, uh, you know, ever-present a work of the Holy Spirit. So I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Okay, that I will be delivered from prison. I will be set free. So that was his faith. That was his expectation, and also that was uh, that was something he firmly believed that through the church's prayer and by the work of the Spirit that he will be set free. He will be delivered from prison. Um, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, um, as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether in life or in, whether by life uh, or by death. So that was his thing that uh, I know that you're praying and then, um, you know, I know that God is working and he is pouring out his spirit. So I know this will turn out for my deliverance. And my expectation is that you know nothing in nothing I'll be uh, I'll be ashamed, but with all boldness, um, as always, that Christ will be magnified in my body. That Christ will be magnified, meaning that will Christ will be made big for all, or put on display for all to see, whether by life or by death. Okay. So that was his earnest expectation and hope, his expectation and hope, his joyful expectation, right? That this is how it will be, that whether by life or by death, that Christ will be magnified. And so, um, and then verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Okay, so... Um, so for him to live is uh, is Christ, meaning that uh, that it it will be according to the will of God and in the purpose of God that Christ will be made manifest. Right? To for me to live is Christ. 
right? What the Lord Jesus would do in every situation, what the Lord Jesus would do to, uh, to minister, to reach out, um, to deliver, to heal, for me to live is Christ. Right? It'll be the manifestation of Christ. It'll be the display of Christ each and every day, each and every moment. You know, it's such a bold and confident and yet a humble declaration, right, of, of the truth of, you know, of his life. Because that is what he has seen and that is what was his present. Because even in prison, that is what was happening, that Christ was being glorified that the gospel was being uh, shared and preached. And uh, he had seen people in every situation, right? Uh, just by looking at his ministry at Philippi itself, you see that in every situation, people have come to know the Lord, right? Uh, whether it was in prison, whether it was, you know, seemingly like, a, it seemed like a, uh, you know, a, a situation which seemed like defeat, which seemed like failure, right? Even in those times, even in those moments, Christ was being preached. Christ was being glorified. In times of persecution, Christ was being glorified. And people were drawn to the Lord. Just imagine the, you know, the, the jailer, right, of the prison in Philippi. The jailer and his family coming to know the Lord and uh, and what what happened? It, it it came out of that prison experience for Paul and Silas. Like they were in prison, and they chose to praise and worship God. They chose to glorify God in prison. Everybody was listening, and they knew that something was different. And they experienced, you know, the supernatural deliverance uh, brought out by God. And and they saw the exemplary character of these two men. If the jailer was about to kill himself and Paul says, don't do that. You know, we're all here. You know, we've not run away. So immediate, immediately the jailer's response is, what must I do? What must I do now? Right? So he was so drawn to Christ through the life of these two men in prison. So, so Paul says with absolute confidence that uh, for me to live is Christ. I know that every moment that I live, that every day that I live, you know, Christ will be magnified. The gospel will be preached, uh, you know, through my life. I know for that. I know that for sure. You know, so it's an amazing uh, declaration. And and our, and our prayer should be that, Lord, let our lives be like that. You know, let my life be like that. To be able to say for me to live is Christ. Uh, it's an expression of Christ. My life in it is an expression of Christ. How Christ would express himself day in and day out, that is what my life is. Right? Which, is um, which means that truly the flesh is put to death each and every moment. Right? The flesh is put to death. Because the flesh also wants to express right? in strife, in anger, in pride, in arrogance flesh in rebellion the flesh just wants to do that so which means in Paul's life the flesh was really put to death flesh was crucified each and every moment so that Christ um, and the life of Christ the love the character the nature of Christ was put on display each and every moment so he says for me to live is Christ okay verse 21 the second part and to die is gain okay so uh, for me to lie, live is Christ. Yes, this is what it is. Well, the second part of it, the other side of it, if I were to die, now that would be a gain. Well, that would be something beneficial, right? Um, and that uh, let me uh, and that word gain, okay, which means uh, which means profit, right? It's uh, it's it's something that is profitable. It is an advantage. Um, so for me to live is this, but then if I were to die, then it's an advantage. Then it's uh, you know uh, uh, something that is uh, uh, beneficial to me. Why? Because he's going to be with the Lord. He's going to be with the Savior whom he's been preaching about. 
talking about it, whom he's been you know pointing people to he's going to be in the presence of god right so uh, for me to live as christ and to die uh, that would be gain right so not just the physical aspect of death or everything coming to an end uh, or all human suffering and uh, human struggle coming to an end not that not that you know it, it's not just that but to be in the presence of the lord and savior right? to be uh, seeing him face to face to be in his presence um, that would be gain okay um, then he goes on the rest of it he goes on to say something about about his life you know and he goes on to explain how for him to live is christ and how that is beneficial right okay so he says uh, in verse 22 but if i live on in the flesh this will mean fruit from my labor yet what i shall choose i cannot tell okay, if i live on in the flesh this will mean fruit from my labor that there will be fruit meaning there will be effectiveness there will be positive results from my labor Okay, so several things we we understand that Paul, his life is going to be one of working for the gospel. He's not going to put up his feet and just relax uh, no matter what, right? So it is going to results result sorry in fruit, meaning uh, uh, you know the uh, positive effect or positive result there will be positive result from his labor so labor which means that um, you know the, the word that is used there uh, talks about business or toil or employment uh, you know some work that is being done hard work that is being done so for paul you know ministry uh, of course you know he's talking about the work of ministry which he was engaged in and that, and that was hard work that was toil that was um you know something that he was engaged in and saying the the things that i do the hard work that i do the labor that i do the, what i toil in there will be result out of it there will be positive result out of it okay if i live on in the flesh this will mean fruit for my labor yet what i shall choose i cannot tell you know when i is looking at you know both both these options you know if the lord were to call him and he uh, for him to die is gain and uh, uh, but if he's going to live it, it will mean result it will mean it will mean both more lives being saved uh, through the gospel it will mean that more lives are being built up right so saying uh, you know this is going to ha happen uh, so but then i'm I'm just being pulled in both directions, right? Um, whether to be here and uh, you know to be with Christ, I'm just you know both these desires are equal. So, you know, something for us to reflect on, right? So, the reality of heaven, the reality of uh, uh, being in the presence of God, um, he had experienced that, right? He had experienced a taste of heaven right um the presence of the lord and uh, and what it means and uh, uh, so for him that was not something boring and sometimes people wonder you know what will i do in heaven you know, just worshiping or singing or you know sometimes our mind is not able to comprehend what will i do there well paul seems to have had a very strong revelation understanding and also the lord that he has preached he has you know he has prayed to and he walked with every each and every moment and every day you know for him his presence for him uh his person everything was so so real that he longed to be with the lord right? and he was actually pulled in both directions and uh, says no yet what i shall choose i cannot tell Verse 23, for I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, you know, which is far better. Um, I, 
you know, all this earthly struggle and everything and things of the flesh, everything is not there anymore. So he's saying, you know, to depart from all this and to be with the Lord is far better. Nevertheless, verse 24, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. The need of the moment is that lives need to be touched, lives need to be ministered to, people need to be ministered to and edified, churches being edified. Right, which was his Paul, which was his ministry, right? Uh, he was doing the very, he was taking the gospel to be, where to places where it was not heard and um, where it was hostile, meaning uh, people were not friendly, they were opposed to it. Uh, but, he, but he took the gospel to such places as an apostle, as a pioneer. Uh, he was also building up the believers, right? With the doctrine and revelation, and he was building up the believer in the deeper things of God, right? Whether it's the work of the Spirit or life in the Spirit or gifts of the Spirit or a revelation of the cross and identity and so on. So he was getting the believers, getting the church uh, to be rooted firmly in the Word of God. So he was doing that as well. So, um, so he says that nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you, the church. And being confident of, confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with this, with you all for all, for your progress and joy of faith. So I, I know that, and I'm confident of this, that I will continue to minister, I will continue to remain and minister, continue with you all for your progress, for your development, for your progress and joy of faith that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. So he was he was expectant. He, he had faith that he would meet them again, that he would be delivered from prison and that he would meet them again. Okay. Um, so verse 27 says, uh, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. I think this is something that he, over and over again, in you know, various epistles, he talks about that. Right? He talks about, uh, like even in Galatians, we saw that you know, Galatians 4, um, uh, sorry, not Galatians, Ephesians 4, sorry. Uh, he, he says, you know, um, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, to walk worthy. Okay. So here again, we see the same thing. Only let your conduct, you know, walking worthy, your conduct be worthy. It's the same thing, saying your, the way you conduct yourself, your life, your speech, your choices, your behavior, your lifestyle. Okay. So he's saying, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Let it be worthy of the gospel, you know, worthy of this good news. This is great news. This is the best news, right? But your life should reflect it. If this is the greatest news, if this is the best news possible for the entire humanity, then your life should show it. The way you live your life for this Savior, like for this Lord and Savior, who gave himself to turn things around in your life, to remove sin, to remove curse, and uh, you know, for eternity to be with him, and uh, so that you will, you know, you will spend eternity. You know, he's changed the destiny. So, if if that is the greatest news, that you are not lost, that you are not hopeless, then let your life be worthy of it. You know, live your life in a manner that is worthy of. This savior, this worthy of this great news, um, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Okay, so whether I'm there in, and I'm present there with you, or whether I'm absent. Even if I'm not present physically, that I, I that I may hear this, you know, uh, good news. That I may hear of your affairs, the what, how you conduct your lives, and right? how you're going about your daily lives, and how you're going about ministry. That I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast, that that you're standing strong. 
that you stand fast with one heart and one mind, you know, in, with one spirit. Okay. Um, let me just uh, here, 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 that you stand fast. Okay. So that word there, which means to stand firm, to persevere, and uh, not fall down, right? to be strong, established. So he's saying, I, I just want to hear this. Right? It just means unmovable, right? unmovable, standing firm, um, established. So this is what I want to hear. Right, that in the long run, right, that you stand firm. Right? So let your so when we say you know let your conduct be worthy, it's it's let it be consistent, right? Let it be consistent. Let it not be up one day and down the other day. Let it not be on one day and then off the other day. Or let you know, let it be consistent. You know, even if I'm not there with you. Even if I'm not there physically in your presence, when I'm when I'm absent, um, you know, when I'm elsewhere, that that I will hear of your affairs, that I will hear that you are doing good spiritually, that you are strong, that you're established, that you're firm, right? With one mind, say so says one spirit, uh, stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Okay, we'll take a break. And then we'll come back and continue with that verse, right? We'll take a break right now for 10 minutes.